I should probably run this on YouTube so I don't get the delay. Actually, uh, I have. YouTube we're on, well. we're on the stream, Calvin. <laughs> nice. Oh, it might be really trippy if you hear like me and you on the stream. Yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was thinking too. So I've got the, got your stream up, and I've got YouTube. Professional streamers here. Yeah, your stream is clean. It looks clean, man. I need yeah, to. You see the you see this, this setup, dude. It's, I love it. Yeah, I, I can't wait to. LED lights. It's really cool. I actually use them on set as well. Nice. Oh, I can't wait to. I can't wait to get things cleaned up again. I'm. Ex I am. I am kind of excited that my drive crashed in a sense where, hey, I get to do it new now, do it fresh. Um. Do you want to do you want to introduce yourself? Maybe I'll add a little text uh, under you as well. If introduce myself, sure. For anybody who doesn't know, I am a uh, match move lead at a studio called Track the Effects in Vancouver, Canada. Um, hmm. Never tried to introduce myself before. Not too sure how much is too much. <laughs> uh, maybe mention you also stream on Twitch, right? Oh yeah, good point. <laughs> I stream on Twitch and YouTube. Um, not not so much as of the past week and a half. My hard drive died, but eventually I'll be getting back. And yeah, I just I go through random shots to work on within Synthize. So if you're into 3D tracking and putting CG into your stuff, you know, come say hi. Who doesn't <laughs> want to be into 3D tracking though? <laughs> it's so cool. Oh, 3D tracking's fun. <laughs> it could be frustrating, but. Man, when it works, it's a good feeling. Blew me away when I first, like, the first I ever understood what tracking was, was, I was like, I think it was like 10, 12 years ago, I touched After Effects. And when I first realized that what a point tracker was, and saw that's how people stick text to things, wow. But then I couldn't for the life of me figure out how people on YouTube were like putting 3D boxes and stuff in their head. Then I accidentally hit some auto tracker in some program i can't remember what and it just blew me away since then there's yeah it was like that's one of the main things that i started learning here. yeah when you when you learn how to track and you're and you can integrate your cg stuff the better you are at tracking the more unstoppable that you're going to be because that's everyone's you typically that's everyone's biggest problem is they can't really they can't really make the stuff work in their shop because they just don't even know how to track it. <laughs> Dude, actually, are you predicting any like uh, updates to Fusion for seventeen? To Fusion? I'm not. I actually have no clue. I've I've rarely rarely used Fusion. Yeah, me me too. Yeah, I, I don't know what to think about it. It's actually think, really uh, lacking in like motion uh, graphic design stuff. So if like Dream Feature, like maybe they kind of target that for this update that would be interesting yeah oh man i see so yeah, that's the thing was i'm i'm decent with resolve i can navigate around it but just because i'm not super deep into it i'd have no clue what to expect here and i'm just yeah i'm, I'm excited to see what comes out of a resolve stream because i've never you know i've just never seen one <laughs> <laughs> i've seen a couple i've seen the one where they i think it was for 16 and they released the cut page uh, and that's just like a big thing that people just don't use, I think. <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I hate the cut page. <laughs> yeah, the, the cut page, wasn't that, isn't that have, doesn't that have something to do with bro like broadcast? Uh, yeah, may, I think it's, it's such a weird thing. Like they just wanted to redesign how you edit. And I think it's like supposed to be easier for multicam stuff where everything is synced by time code. Like in the cut page, you can somewhat like easier change up clips. Uh, but I just never use it. And every time I try to use it, it, because it doesn't have, you know, you just can't move the interface where you want it to move because uh, it's so limited in Resolve. It's just so awkward. Yeah, see Daz the Cat in your yeah. chat. Pages designed for YouTubers, making their work easier. I'd be interested to see. I'd be interested to see some of them go through it. Yeah, I gotta look more into the cut page. 
I gotta, man, I'm super curious about it now. Yeah. By the way, I hope you don't hear your voice feeding back through my mic. The sensitivity no, is up. I, I do not. That's amazing. Y you sound oh, so I got, crisp, dude. Oh, I got RTX voice on. Great. Oh, wait, can I have that? Is that NVIDIA? Uh, yeah, it's for when you have RTX it's nice reduction. What? It, is it noise reduction? Kind of? Yeah, it's AI denoising. It does a, like, right now, if I had speakers playing music just as loud as I am talking, you wouldn't hear me. I mean, sorry, you wouldn't hear the music. Um, I just heard a honk. Oh. <laughs> Do I have a honk? <laughs> I heard a you honk. Shouldn't, you shouldn't have heard that. See, my boss has, <laughs> my boss has this on, too, and uh, sir, uh, for certain company meetings, he'll flip on... He'll flip on the denoiser and the fire trucks and like everything going on outside his apartment like just dies. Wow. But I, I've played like loud synth music, like loud, just to test and it would all be gone. I'm surprised you heard that honk. <laughs> <laughs> the, I'm going to clip that later and be like, yeah, okay, it's like... <laughs> that's, that's too perfect, dude. <laughs> the timing was pretty great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> fool out of me car um but yeah it's, it's um but the tool it also will regulate your vo like a lot of tools do this i know but rtx will also regulate your volume like when you talk it tries to fix it tries to regulate the sound through the mic that's really cool so it, yeah, it does some denoising and also some regulating i don't even know if that's the technical term i don't think First, i actually yeah. sound that great on this mic I, I was tweaking it today as well. Uh, I think okay. it's still really noisy. Cut and fusion pages hidden. You can hide those pages? You can. Yeah. Whoa. How how do you is it as simple as a right click? Uh I'm gonna I'm gonna keep those I think and it's play in the around. Drop down. Uh yeah. I plan to I plan to play around with fusion more. I, I gotta start learning a bit a few more compositors because some clients have been asking for random camera tracks to be in all these different software it's weird yeah we had somebody recently and this is not too common but somebody wanted us to set up an after effects script so ooh, that, that one was a little fun they wanted a very specific type of export out of synthize which i'm surprised they knew about <laughs> um there's a feature where if you make some planes just a plane geometry flat plane like if you build geometry in other programs, bring it into After Effects, you can't. After Effects has solids, right? Mm -hmm. um, if you sent, there's something about just making a normal card or a plane and synthize, and when you export it, After Effects knows what that plane is and turns it into a solid. But if you take a plane or just a flat piece of geo from any other software, the the magic is gone. So Synthize is keeping some kind of history on their geometry. Oh. Oh. I think we're, we're after that. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I'm curious if anybody can keep up with the, you know, <laughs> the yeah, te technical I, problems of <laughs> tracking and Synthize and then moving things to After Effects. Yeah, I kind of <laughs> trailed on there. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll have to rejoin the call. Uh, I have to go talk to a different coworker. Okay. But you're going to be <laughs> back soon because the timer just ended and it's supposed to be starting, right? Oh, they're fighting. Oh, man. Uh... Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. I said, to, I said, hey, one second. <laughs> Hold on. Let me figure this out. If it gets too much, I'll turn off the, the webcam and chat so you can see more. Actually, I'll... Yeah, I got both. I got both your stream and the YouTube gone. Oh my coworker will be five minutes. Okay. Let's do this for now. Man, I gotta watch Midsummer. Thinking of editing, I finally watched Whiplash, and oh my god, the cuts in that movie. It's so good. This is a sick intro.
Uh, you call. So you called me on a personal call. So I would. So what to? If I had to jump out and then jump back in, like I, I should just voice call you through this personal message. Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. That's yeah. So word. one, one. Yeah. So one of my coworkers ready. I'll, I'll jump out just to go through our plan for our stuff. Alright. I'll see you when that or when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Alita Battle Angel looked like such a scary shot, a uh, scary movie for tracking. All the rotomations where you have to take a 3D person and hand match every frame of the saw, uh, shot with it. Never actually played a whole lot with Fusion's 3D tracker. I'm curious how much control there is with it. There's a massive smile on my face. I am Graham from Black Magic Design, and today I'd like to give you an update on what's <laughs> new with DaVinci Resolve 17. Now, with COVID, we're not launching <laughs> this guy does a trade show like we normally do. So we thought we'd do things a little bit differently. <laughs> we're going to be uh, using trainers to show each part of DaVinci. Um, I'll show the cut page, but the trainers can show the other parts. It allows Shit. them to show you cut in detail much page. better um, with different God sections of DaVinci. Because obviously <laughs> DaVinci itself is a Just really big uh, tool. <laughs> this is also a very big software update. It's a very exciting update, actually. It's really exciting. Now we're not adding any new pages into DaVinci Resolve 17, but we have done hundreds of cleanups, some really powerful new features. So let's get straight into it and um, we'll show you what's new. But before we start, um, there's just something I want to make a note of so you understand a little bit better what we're doing. We're going to be using screen recordings and so we're going to be using low resolution monitors so you can see the whole UI. So you can really see what we're doing because we're moving around the whole user interface. It means the UI will be a little bit bigger but it's a bit more cluttered. So normally when you're using DaVinci, you know, you've got a bigger monitor. Um, in our case, we're going to be using lower resolution monitors so the user interface will be a little bit bigger. But it means you can see what we're doing. Um, so I think if you're watching the video stream, you just want to play it full screen. Then you can see the UI details better and see what we're doing. I think what he's saying is DaVinci so Resolve is unusable color. on 1920 by 1080. Now we've got a really big update. Like Basically. The results have been the big updates for color. I'm happy he was um, making the distinction. Color grading is DaVinci's heritage. So it's an exciting to be a really big major that change to DaVinci color correction. So, Let's play the yeah, when I have to remote in and help action. people on their 4K monitors, in I just, 17, I just can't see new but creative tools have been added with all the, the compression and the HDR primary grading palette. So this is good that they're the color doing warper, this, I think. And the magic mask. There has also been a significant update to Resolve's internal color management, and a number of improvements have been made to the color page user interface. I think they changed the buttons. We'll begin with the brand new HDR primary grading palette designed for targeted grading of wide latitude media. The palette splits up the video image into overlapping tonal ranges, or zones, so you can make precise color and contrast adjustments across multiple stops of light. The default palette preset features six tonal zones and a global wheel. You can see three zones represented at any given time, and shift to the other zones using the banking controls under the palette header. I like that that little scroll wheel is gone. Wheel affects the entire tonal range of the yeah. image, tapering at the white and black point to produce That's color just and for the changes stuff. that feel smooth might, and natural. Uh, Still be like it is before. Use the familiar control point to change oh, hue. Oh, I've never looked in there. Yeah, that's a new button. Or the exposure and saturation controls to establish the brightness and color intensity. Sliders on either side of the global wheel allow you to adjust temperature and tint. In this example, we have a wide dynamic range image with an underexposed interior and overexposed exterior, a common occurrence in documentary or on location shooting. After establishing the starting point of the grade using the global wheel, we can go to the options and include it when banking wheels, allowing us to focus on four tonal zones at once. The tonal range of each wheel can be reviewed and customized in the zones panel. Oh. The graph represents the luminance range in stops. The center of the graph, zero, represents middle gray, also known as 18% gray. Clicking on a zone name in the sidebar highlights its position on the graph. The red gradient represents its fall off, an it's area of gentle transition at the start of, of a tonal range. How much the wheel grabs. Everything beyond the fall off <laughs> is impacted by adjustments in that range. And as you can see, there's substantial overlap between the zones, which reduces artifacting when grading. You can drag a zone line to increase or decrease the tonal range, or use the range and fall off fields underneath to change their numeric values. The black zone can be used to establish the darkest region in the frame. 
when working with overexposed areas, reducing the light zone exposure and adjusting saturation can help bring back details without needing secondary grading tools. An overlapping but more narrow zone, like the specular, can be used to bring out minor detail in the image highlights. Additional global controls can be found at the bottom of the palette. When adjusting contrast, the HDR palette eliminates unwanted saturation changes, resulting in perceptually uniform color intensity as you raise and lower contrast. When comparing this example before and after, you can see how much the HDR palette accomplished with just a few adjustments. Another addition to the palettes is the Color Warper, a mesh-based warping tool that allows for quick, intuitive adjustments of color and luminance simultaneously. I've seen that before. The expand arrow was at the top turns the like Color Warper into a floating uh, palette that can be resized for better detail control. Now it's an actual feature. There are two ways to start using the Color Warper. First, you can click directly in the One viewer second. and begin dragging to change the values. An orange highlight will indicate your selected control point and its position on the Color Warper grid. The second way is to click within the grid itself to select the necessary control points. As you can see, multiple hues can be adjusted on the same grid. A drop-down menu at the top allows you to switch between the two color warper Oh, panels, is this lattice new? Hue and saturation, mm -hmm. or chroma thing. and luma. The controls in the chroma and luma grid are similar, though this time the interface is an interactive 3D cube mesh, with the hues represented on the horizontal axis and luminance represented on the vertical. The waveform in the center represents the current color and luminance values of the image. Use the axis angle parameter to define the hue region you want to work on. In this example, the low grid resolution makes it difficult to change the color of the sky without affecting the rest of the image. Controls underneath the grid let you change the division amount, increasing the chroma and luma resolution in cases where you need more color precision. The tools to the right allow you to refine your selection, and additional locking controls below allow for very precise color adjustments. By locking off a luminance section of the Looks image, really complicated. you can darken and color the sky without affecting the data in the shadow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> and then click on the clouds in the viewer. For and something that is pretty much a. For are you familiar with the HSL contrast. sliders from uh, Lightroom? Yeah. Compare the image yeah. before and after yeah, that's pretty to much see it. how much detail that's the color warper has different. brought into the sky <laughs> without affecting the surrounding areas. Another major addition to the color page is the I magic I think mask. I understand it. This is a neural engine powered secondary grading tool that can save hours of work by automatically creating and tracking masks to isolate a person or their physical features for targeted color grading. At the top of the palette, two buttons allow you to select your preferred tracking mode, a full person or a specific physical feature, which you can select from the drop down menu. To begin tracking, oh, click please. and drag in the viewer to draw a small stroke on the person you wish to track. Small strokes are better, as they will follow movement without interruption. This is your jam, man. The mask overlay <laughs> button is used to review the oh, no. selection. Just as my coworker is like, oh, I'm ready to go on if Discord. If you're satisfied with the mask, use the transform controls to run an analysis. That's an automatic roto. Right? After I'll tracking, Parker, one minute. use the I mask finesse this. controls to refine the resulting mask. With the track successful, disable the mask overlay and perform your secondary grade as needed. Oh my god. <laughs> this before and after comparison shows how you can use the magic mask to pop someone out of a visually busy environment. Use the invert button if you it, wish to focus your selection the outside character. the track person. This can be effective for grading backgrounds to be less yeah, just, distracting. Just roto. Or for Why did she put the line on the chin, like how they define the rest of the character? DaVinci Resolve 17 has undergone the biggest changes to its internal color management since it was first introduced. When you now enable DaVinci Color Management in the project settings, you will see a simplified menu offering a list of common color workflow presets. Each preset includes a brief description of its intended use. The DaVinci Wide Gamut and Intermediate Tonal Range is a new working color space listed in the settings. DaVinci Wide Gamut features a wider gamut than the oh, UHD Erector right 2020 back. standard, I'm going to talk to my coworker and gamut, try to get that pass as fast as I can. <laughs> By mapping your Seriously. timeline to the widest possible gamut at the start of your workflow, you're able to future-proof your projects and prepare them for both SDR and HDR delivery. Many other additions and improvements have been made to the color page interface. The viewer now features three new image white modes, diagonal, Venetian blind, and checkerboard. When creating smart filters on the color page, you now have a show in all projects checkbox to save favorite filters across all projects in your database. 
The GPU Scopes panel has improved scale and styling options for the waveform and vector scope. This includes the ability to change the waveform graticule scale to display in HDR NIT values. The expanded GPU scopes now feature a 3x3 view, allowing you to set up multiple identical scope types with unique parameters. That is massive. That is amazing. And when working with dual monitors, it is now possible to drag the floating scopes window onto your second display. The primaries wheels palette has been redesigned, with the adjustment controls now accessible in one panel at the top and bottom of the palette. The Curves palette now features a new HSL curve, SAT versus Loom, in which you can adjust the luminance of a specific saturation range. You can now also pop out the Curves palette to allow for much finer curve adjustments. Some that additional support well. and functionality has been provided for colorists who work with LUTs, or lookup tables. It is now possible to create custom LUT paths and organize them into folders. Simply enter the preferences, click on the General tab, and add your LUT location. After refreshing, any subfolders in that location will appear as folders in the LUT panel. That is massive as well. And as with regular LUTs, you'll be able to access them in the contextual menus of the timeline clips and nodes. If you are working on a collaborative project in a facility, you can add your LUTs to a shared folder on the server so you and your colleagues can access the same lookup tables while you work. The ResolveFX library has been expanded with 11 new creative tools and updates to its existing effects. Among them, the motion trails effect can be used to imitate a slower shutter speed. While false color allows you to check the exposure values of your video yes. based on specific camera model ranges. Oh, that's so good. There's also a creative mode in which you can emulate posturization looks like thermal or night vision. If you have a DaVinci Resolve Advanced panel, these new features are supported with an optional redesigned keycap set. Advanced and mini panels can now be connected to remote grading machines and multiple clients can now connect to the same remote grading session. These are just some of the new features in DaVinci Resolve 17's color page. So as you can see, this is a big update for colorists. Yeah, and a lot of the features in here have been years of engineering work. So it's really exciting to see these really good. features finally get into the shipping product. Now, if you're using the DaVinci Resolve Advanced Console, we have a new set of keycaps hey, um, in DaVinci Resolve 17. You can use the old Massive keycaps, stuff. but there's now a new set of keycaps. Uh, you can pop there's been a lot of changes now, in DaVinci over so time. And so we thought the keycaps um, would be a lot better to support those changes. But also, can make just in update, general, have better usability than where the old are. set of keycaps. Now, the DaVinci Advanced Panel keycaps... Do that motion trails kind of blew me away. Now, there's the keys you and also a tool to help you install them. Yep. You can swap out oh, yeah. each key individually. <laughs> cool. Each key is replaced. Every key has got a replacement. Now, the DaVinci Advanced Panel keycaps will be available now, and they'll be priced at $5.95. And once you've installed them, it's like getting a whole new panel because, I mean, the entire keycap set will be replaced. So that's a pretty nice upgrade and it's worth checking out. Now, let's talk about audio. Um, we've got some really Fairlight. exciting updates to Fairlight. Oh. Um, we've also oh, made we talking uh, about Fairlight, Fairlight now? more accessible to new users. Yeah, he's going to be talking about Fairlight. Mouse and keyboard. It originally cool, Fairlight I'm actually just diving into. Yeah. Uh, there's some changes there. It's but there's really also good, some very powerful updates in, the, in its feature it's set better, in general. It's, it's epic. So let's play the clip and uh, check it out. The Fairlight page in DaVinci Resolve 17 is faster and more powerful than ever with an enhanced edit selection tool set, automatic transient detection, comprehensive Dolby Atmos integration, plus the introduction of a brand new audio core engine and Flexbus customizable busing, clip aware automation, and more. Let's start with the improved edit selection mode. This update takes Fairlight's multifunction edit selection tool and shortcuts to a whole new level with a more advanced tool set, live editing preview, and lightning fast response time even during playback and recording. Edit selection mode combines the selection arrow and the range tools to give you an advanced edit selection tool that automatically changes based on where and how you click. Drag the edges of a clip to trim the head or tail. Drag the volume curve to change the level and option click to add volume keyframes. Move the pointer to the lower half of a clip for the grab tool functions. Click to select an entire clip and drag to move it. Click the upper half of a clip to set an edit point or drag to select a range. The new live preview feature updates the viewer while you work, so you can see a live update while dragging a selection range and moving clips in a timeline. In edit selection mode, playback will always start at the new edit selection whenever you press the spacebar, so you can click anywhere in the timeline and instantly preview the audio from that point without having to move the That is handy. Hand. 
Modifier keys offer additional functionality. Hold Shift and Drag to extend and edit selection. Option Drag to duplicate a selection and release the mouse to paste. And use Command or Shift to extend selections to additional tracks. In Edit Selection mode, you can solo scrub the audio for any clip anywhere in the timeline. Just hold Shift and Command while dragging over the clip. When you scrub a clip with the Edit Selection tool, the corresponding track is temporarily soloed. Keyboard shortcuts are the secret to unleashing the full power and speed of Fairlight's Edit Selection mode. For quick access to the Edit Selection toolset, use the right-click context menu in the timeline. DaVinci Resolve 17 includes a set of shortcuts listed next to each menu option so you can learn as you go. If you're coming from another system, you can assign your own shortcuts in the keyboard customization window. There's even a Pro Tools preset to make the transition to Fairlight even easier. Use the standard three-button mouse and modifiers for additional zooming and scrolling options. Hold Option while scrolling the middle mouse button to zoom horizontally around the playhead or edit selection. Hold Shift to zoom vertically around the selected track. Hold Command to scroll earlier or later in the timeline. Or scroll without a modifier to scroll up or down oh, to higher like or lower tracks. Scrolling. And finally, you can hold Shift I Option together to scroll the waveform scroll, zoom yeah. without changing volume. Wait, we, wait, we couldn't do that? The also do that has transient result, detection. No which can well, be used can to automatically page. identify transients inside huh. audio clips. Once detected, the transients can be used for edit selection. The combination of Fairlight's transient detection and edit selection shortcuts have the potential to further increase your audio editing speed and efficiency without the need for additional hardware or third-party tools. DaVinci Resolve 17 Studio is now certified with fully integrated Dolby Atmos home theater workflows. Studio users can now open, sync, and play back master files in the Resolve timeline. Goodness. Let's preview a master file in the media page. Here, the internal Dolby Atmos renderer is playing the clip in a 714 channel format, but the file actually references all the content in the master file, up to 128 bed and object tracks. You can use clip attributes to change the output format to a speaker layout that matches your monitoring Whoa. configuration. In this case, I'll keep the original format and create a new timeline with the clip. As you can see in the edit page, here's the new timeline with the 714 render, and I can sync and play the clip. In the Fairlight page, you can see the channels in the timeline and the Dolby badge to indicate it is actually a rendered master file. You can render the timeline in the Deliver page in an IMF package as an IAB MXF file, or as an ADM broadcast wave file. You can also import a master file through the immersive audio options in the Fairlight page to recreate the full Dolby master file, including content, bed and object tracks, as well as panning metadata. To see the panning metadata, increase the track height and choose which panning curve you'd like to see in the timeline tracks. Each track in the mixer shows live panning updates during playback. Double click one of the track pan controls to open the full pan window where you can see the panning automation and controls for the selected track. Or use Fairlight's Ooh. space view scope to visualize really all cool. the objects used in the master file at the same time I think that's so new, you can the see how they view. relate to the immersive space and one another. Solo tracks to isolate their objects in the space view scope. Or change a track's color so the corresponding object stands out among the that other objects. That is amazing. Whether the soundscape sits the mood of a scene. And Playback it's all and monitoring about panels is fully too, integrated so with Dolby's they're embracing internal customization renderer, more. so you can it's monitor, lovely. trim, and downmix. Oh yeah, I didn't pick formats. up on that. Yeah, that's like, yeah, that's great. And export a new master file when you're ready. The Fairlight page offers all the tools you need to create, mix, and deliver immersive projects, or use the AAF options to import a session from another system like Pro Tools and finish it here in Resolve. The new Fairlight Audio Core engine is an advanced high-performance audio engine designed to let you work with up to 2,000 tracks of simultaneous playback with extremely low latency on a single system. 2,000 trucks.
This completely scalable hybrid engine eliminates the need to run multiple systems for large format oh, look projects. Look at that, Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> to support the new audio engine and high <clears throat> track count capabilities is the revolutionary new Flexbus busing architecture designed for the ultimate flexibility in user-defined bus types. How many audio tracks do control. you need? Yes. Flexbus uses logical <laughs> cascading buses to help you build up each main sound group from smaller mixes for more control and better sound. Legacy fixed busing was rigid with limited options for a fixed number of main, submix, and auxiliary buses. Flexbus offers a single user-defined bus that has the ability to pass signals from mono to fully immersive formats up to 26 channels wide and can be changed at any time. Bus outputs and sends can be patched one at a time in the mixer or all at once in the bus assign window. And users can control the routing of the buses in any way that's needed for the project, including bus to bus, bus to track, or track to bus. With Flexbus, you can direct signals to many different places at the same time to achieve complex mixing. For example, if you need to generate two mixes with different output levels, simply split the final mix bus to two more buses, each with a limiter set to the necessary output level creating two different mixes at one time. Another awesome new feature in the Fairlight page is the ability to link separate mono clips so you can edit them as if they were a single clip. Once linked, you can also render the linked clips into a new multi-channel file. Here is the new multi-channel clip in the media pool and in the timeline. If you ever need to break a multi-channel clip into separate mono tracks, you just right-click the track header and choose Convert to Linked Group. Now you have mono clips in separate tracks that are linked as a group with a single 5.1 channel fader. And if you open the Link Group window, you can unlink the tracks, leaving you back where you started with linked mono clips in separate tracks. Notice in the mixer that the mono tracks are still panned to the proper 5.1 channel. And finally, to take the example full circle, you can always right click to unlink them. Fairlight's powerful automation toolset has been upgraded as well, with new clip-aware functionality that you can toggle on and off with the Automation Follows Edit button. When enabled, automation data is added to the audio clips themselves, so edits will be reflected in the embedded automation. Move a clip, the automation follows. This also applies to clips that are copied and pasted somewhere else in the timeline. Automation Follows Edit is great for tightening edits and moving whole scenes. To move an entire show, use the Whoa. universal editing shortcuts to select all, cut, move the playhead, then paste. I need that in Ableton As you right can now. See, all of the automation moved with the clip. Unless it already has it, I wouldn't know. These are just some of the exciting it new might. audio Wait. features hmm. that you'll find on the Fairlight That's page really cool. in DaVinci Resolve 17. So you can see this is a really big update for Fairlight. Uh, we think it'll really there. help people who are getting started in audio post-production. Um, but we've also had a lot of people linking asking about clips getting it to work with a mouse and keyboard. Uh, like audio tools, clips, so we think it'll take and then you can pan all of them together. Well. So I think um, before you have to take all of them and send really them to like a bus, and then pan that bus. Um, who are using the really big uh, consoles. But this is a little so it's more really intuitive got something for people. everyone, we believe. Um, now, while we're talking about consoles, let's uh, focus on that. Yeah, we've got a really good range of fantastic studio consoles. You know, go from two bay always all the way up to five bay. Now, originally, Fairlight only worked with consoles. That was the, you know, came with consoles. And we've done a lot of work to make it work with a keyboard and mouse. Um, and that really helps people get started because you don't need a console. But we do have a big gap between using it with a mouse. I don't know if you actually wanted to say that, that console. Fairlight used so really to only work with between. consoles. Now, we've come up with a, a new, pa uh, new console. Hmm. Uh, it's called the Fairlight Desktop Console. Um, we've got some slides to show you so you can see what it looks like. You can see there it is there. It's got 12 incredibly high quality photos. And they're flying photos with touch sensitivity as well. Now you can see the transport controls there on the right hand side with a, with a really nice metal search dial. Feels really good. And um, there's studio monitoring controls up the top right hand side. There's a whole bunch of channel LCDs with pan controls on them. But all those uh, channel control LCDs can also be used to, uh, for menuing. So all the knobs can be used together for a single channel. Um, so, example, you know, if you push like the EQ button on the left hand side, then all the knobs will become EQ settings. So it's really nice. Um, and you've got all kinds of power. You know, those knobs can be switched across to do EQ, pan, and all the dynamics like limiters and compressors. Um, now, it plugs in with USB or Ethernet. There's a slide at the back. You can see the rear 
connect, uh, connectors, but you notice there's a HDMI connector there. Now the big Fairlight consoles have these really large LCD monitors on them, and we wanted the desktop console to, console to have a similar feature. So this helps you move between the desktop consoles and the big you know, studio consoles. So we think it's a really important feature and it's an exciting feature as well. So you can plug a 1080 HD TV or computer monitor into, into the connector there, and you get the full channel summary of all the channels and the same, you know, very similar kind of um, status as what the uh, studio, big studio consoles have. So that's really cool. Now there's uh, loads of audio meters on really the cool. LCD monitor, um, all the busings displayed there, um, but also the whole LCD can switch to focus on a single channel. So normally you see an overview there and you can see all your panning information, but if you select some of the processing then it'll go to a single channel. And you can see there's a slide there that shows that and you can see there's lots of information about the single channel um, and all the various processing curves and that, it's really amazing. So now I have one here um, set up, so let's pan across and have a look and you can see one working, uh, a real one. Now you can see it's an all metal design, uh, it's got it's, it's a desktop mounted this one, it's got fold out feet so you can tilt it up, that's tilted up. You know there. what I'm worried about um, but you can also those flush devices. mount it in the desk if you cut a hole because it's got a, hmm. a, a ridge around the outside. They're only so compatible with flush. the Venture Resolve. Now I all think. the faders are the same as the studio consoles, they're really good oh, quality, not. the best quality possible faders we could find. <laughs> I never looked into it but that, um, that's like smooth and a lot of those nicely. DaVinci products. Um, nice DC motors, beautiful bearings. Now all the faders and knobs are touch sensitive, so the knob here and the Just faders... Give me one for you with a camera, please. And the UI will display <laughs> when you're touching, it'll tell you that you're uh, holding it. Now you can also do more than 12 channels. Um, so you can adjust some levels and then like bank. So if I adjust um, some levels here, then I can bank across to the next 12. And I can just keep banking through. So you can see that you can have a lot of channels. Um, now we've got a really large multi-track project on this iMac. So if I turn on the, auto, um, the automation, which I'll do with the button up there, there's automation controls here, you can see I can press play and you can watch all the faders move around and see how all that works. And there are obviously all the flying faders there, you can see it go. You can even bank across while you're doing that. So it all just tracks and you, know, as you, you, know, you can have hundreds of channels. Um, it's really, really nice. I don't you know, know for anybody that hasn't seen all something the navigation like that before, it's pretty on the basic for audio so consoles. Like, they all do panel. that pretty much. Now there's transport <laughs> controls on the right side, you can see the search It was too late in my life when I realized they all moved by themselves. This still excites me. <laughs> for example, if I do shuttle, I can do shuttle. Uh, sorry, that's scroll. So you can see I'm scrolling up and down the timeline faster, but normally it's just jogs, so you can move around. That still looks cool. Much finer control. Also, there's a zoom not button at the bottom here. The camera, so you can you know, spend a lot of time in audio <laughs> zooming the timeline in and out, and you can do that from the search dial. So if you push that button there, and you can do that with your thumb when you're using it. Obviously, I'm using it from behind, but if you're on the other side, you can do it with your thumb and you can get all that working. Now, all your studio monitoring controls for your speakers are all up the top right here. Um, and of course, the channel controls are really where all the power is. So each channel has an LCD and, and, um, and a fader and a knob. Um, now the way they work is the knobs and the buttons are on a single channel. So you've got a select button and a solo and mute and a knob. And they work on an individual channel. So you can do like, you know, level adjustments. Oh, I've got the automation on. You can do level adjustments and controls of pan. But you can then uh, get all those knobs to work together. So if you pre press any of the processing selection on the left-hand side, so for example, if I'll press EQ so you can see what happens. Now if you can get the overhead camera and see, that's all the channel controls and you see the, 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 uh, the information about each channel. But if I push EQ, which I've done there now, what they've done is they've switched over. And now each knob is actually one of the parameters of the EQ. So if I adjust, you know, like the gain of the high frequencies here, what I'm now doing is this knob is, on, you know, is being used to adjust just that one parameter, so it's really nice. You can use all the knobs to work together. Say if I change the compressor, whoops, there's a compressor there. Now you'll get a whole bunch of compressor settings and all the knobs will work together, so it's really nice. But it gets more interesting with the uh, external LCD. Um, now, this is really exciting because we think that one of the great things about having the desktop console on the monitor here is it's a fantastic way of training people without using you know, the cost of a giant console. Now you can see, if I go back, I'll turn off the compressor settings, you can get the summary back on the monitor. You can see you can see all the meters and the channel status, and it's very similar graphics to the giant studio consoles. Um, and so the great thing is, you, this, so what we're looking at right now is an overview of all the channels that you see here, and each channel has a, its you know, pan position in 3D space. You can see there. Um, but as I said, you know when the display switches over to a focus mode, that happens when you select uh, any of the processing on an individual channel. So, for example, if I go back and press the EQ, and you probably noticed this before, now you can see that's changed over to a focused mode, and on the LCD. You can see that it's selected the, LC, uh, the, the EQ parameters, and it's also, yeah, there's a curve there, and if I adjust the gain, oops. You, you the know gain, what? You Actually, like, 
adjust How is this relevant to the DaVinci Resolve 17? Same as if I adjust the compressor. <laughs> Sorry if I oh, good point. Compressor. This is like you can a see now that the, the massive knobs in the bottom, freaking the ad break in the middle of the stream. The <laughs> so everything about the channel is displayed on I hope this there's one some display. specific really, functionality, really nice. I guess, that's special to this. And you get all this just this. by plugging in a monitor. But I, I don't so know very, anything very cool. about consoles. Now, the Fairlight desktop console uh, will be available for the end of the year. It'll be priced at three thousand four hundred ninety-five. Expensive. You know, we think it's the highest quality desktop audio console available. You know, it's an amazing console. And it really fills the gap between a mouse and a studio console, um, and it'll be really exciting, I think, when it's available later this year. But it also, just looks great. I mean, I think it just looks really nice. I mean, when you're playing, you see all the meters are up, and it just looks really nice. It just uh, it's incredible. I think having the LCD on it's really really nice. Now, well, this better stop, I guess, so I can keep talking. So look, a lot of the, um, one thing that we've also noticed over the last few months is a lot of Fairlight customers wanted to build custom consoles. Now we have the two, <laughs> They're going three, Apple four, and five bay consoles, uh, but a lot of people would like to build their own. And so now we sell no. these uh, Fairlight consoles in modular <laughs> form because also a lot of people like to not fully populate a console when they buy it so they can buy the modules as they go. But we wanted to help customers build custom furniture. So the first step and Wait, one what? of the first requests people had is putting their own monitors or televisions on. So not using the built-in monitors that you can buy for the Fairlight consoles, but using their own televisions or their own monitors, sometimes on monitor stands and things like that. So we have a Fairlight HDMI interface that we've developed. And what it allows you to do is instead of plugging the monitor in and using a monitor, it allows you to use any 16x9 uh, HDMI TV or monitor. Now I'll show you what it looks like. Um, there it is there. So it's just a simple little converter. You plug your uh, Ethernet into it. It looks like one of the big monitors. It's actually the same electronics that drives the monitor that's in the Fairlight studio console. In fact, this electronics is also in here. And it'll then drive a HDMI or SDI display, so you can choose what type of display you want. Now that's $259, and it'll be av it's available now. And if you buy one of those, when you're building the console in the, build in the console application, in the DaVinci software, you can actually, this will, the software will see this as being one of the monitors. Then you can use your own monitors. So I think that's pretty nice. But the other thing is that people are doing is they're also building their own custom furniture. Like they're literally building their own desks and they're putting uh, the bays in. So we really wanted to help people do that. Um, can we call the Vinci now, Resolve the problem, a of course, is that now? You can create desks any sort of shape. You can create all sorts of desks. Or has it desks. been considered a door? The problem is it can be a little I, difficult I to get all the, the, uh, the bays the problems, in and aligned properly. Particularly on what the bays interfering with each other. Um, so we really wanted to help carpenters be so able to really set the export things. Keep uh, so just give me MIDI. <laughs> Why are they selling furniture <laughs> now? <laughs> Look at this. What, <laughs> what is going on? So this is what the inside of the console looks like. Um, and what we have is we have all these uh, pins, these mounting pins here. And what they do is they, oops, it's really heavy. <laughs> um, what they do is they, the, the, uh, the bays mount into these pins and it keeps them accurately aligned so they don't interfere with each other and they don't strike each other if you lift them up. So the bays in the Fairlight console actually tilt up and you can put the modules in. So we'll be selling oh, it looks these. looks like he's assembling um, an Ikea also bed frame. Also there's a side, yeah. I'll put this down because uh, it's a bit big. There's a side mounting arm kit as well. The I'll venture is all 17 up Now what this stream. does is this is a <laughs> other little part that will be available. Now what happens is all the modules that you buy with Fairlight, if you buy a giant console you kind of get all this. but these side mounting arms, you put the, uh, the various modules in and the monitor sticks in there. And then this will then pip, you know, uh, slide into the big console and it pivots up and down. So what you really want is have these and you need the mounting bar and it lets you build your own custom furniture. It's a little bit big, so I'll move it out of the way here. Now all these parts will be available now and the prices will be on the DaVinci website. There's a whole range of different options you need. For yeah, I'm in no place to judge consoles. the significance of Fairlight right okay, now, so but now we're up to the man, I'm page. really now, interested to see if, how many people page, are excited really about this or what thoughts are generate, uh, sort of within like the you know, audio community. You know, if you think back, we had linear editing in the 1970s and 1980s. Then it went to non-linear editing with editing software in the sort of late 80s and early 90s. Um, but there hasn't been a lot of innovation since. You know, there's been some very good incremental updates. There's also been much better availability of editing software. Um, but we wanted to do something sort of bigger. We wanted to create a next generation. And so, you know, the, the problem we've got, um, well, what we essentially want to do is a combination of hardware and software. We thought that was really the way to go. You know, traditional editing software is really designed to work with a mouse. Um, and so the difficulty, of course, is, is trying to add any sort of hardware integration. And that's quite difficult. With the cut page, what we really were work focused on was designing a page that would work with hardware. Now, the DaVinci Resolve editor keyboard is very traditional, but it's really the first step that we took. But it is very traditional. It's got the QWERTY keyboard, that, that so it's kind of more like a keyboard that would cool work keyboard. with a normal edit software. 
what we really wanted to do is um, is go further because that you know, that panel is really designed for older edit software in many ways because of the QWERTY keyboard. So we've been working on something else, and that's what we've been. That's where our, really our focus you know, was. Um, I'm watching so what on I want to do is introduce the stream on speed editor. Is showing now, me the stream faster than YouTube is showing me the stream. Showing me the stream. I've got one here. You can see it there. I'm in the future, Calvin. Um, <laughs> watch the stream. <laughs> and, uh, now it's different to a regular. I actually am. <laughs> it's specifically designed for the cut page, and so it's faster. It's much faster. I think to it's use. because I was um, here before so the stream started. That, what I'll do is, um, oh, okay. I really want to show you the cut page first features know. first. So okay, I'll come back to the speed editor later and I'll show you how that works. It'll be a bit less confusing that way. So. Let's go over to the computer. I'll put this what down here. I've got you on over like camera. A minute ahead. So I'll put that in the right position so <laughs> we can play with it later. Very good. But what I'll do is I'll go across to the computer here and we'll uh, create a new project and get going. And I'll show you the, what's new on the cut page. So if you can cut across to the... You're far away from the equator. You've got that time okay, space we'll we'll relativ relativity going on. <laughs> cut page, dude. Here we go. Demo. Oh, Here's dude, imagine if it page. crashed live on stream. Okay. Now we'll need to load Ooh. in some clips. <laughs> And I've got some clips here on my desktop. Didn't this. that happen to Maya once? Yeah. Didn't Maya do this once? Oh, oh wait, you wouldn't no, also need to create a new timeline. Or use Maya or watch that. No, I wouldn't. I mean, <laughs> I I would if <laughs> you were watching. Now, these are handheld shots I took in London. So what we'll do is let's create an edit Maya first. is like one of the most widely used programs yeah. in so the effects industry. And I think uh, they we'll tried to show it off once and it crashed on them. And that it's known good. for crashing. Uh, what, what is it in the uh, editing world, to be honest? Yeah. What Let's is it? Maya's for no, no, I mean, well, What yeah. isn't known for crashing? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like all the memes, you know, <laughs> Premiere crashing, After Effects crashing. Now, one of the new things in... Yeah, TV people are even like, Blender doesn't crash. Blender edit. crashes on me all the time. Durations. So I've got a nice five-second clip there. I can drop that into the timeline. So I've got a nice edit. However, let's use the source tape because this is actually how normally you would edit, but it's a little slow. So by using the source tape, we can look at all our media in one go. So I'll just go up here and select the source tape. Now I'm looking at everything I've got. This is, odd. This is just like making so a select timeline, find a clip. you know, like when you drag all the footage into one timeline. Select an in-out point. Okay, no. Just like the uh, append like and insert point. tools. We'll append. Uh, yeah, that, let's that's also find another clip. There's a nice clip of people walking. Scroll along a little. Our point in the pen. But we can also do a smart insert. So if you want to insert, you can see the indicator here. So if I find a different clip, like this one here, it looks pretty nice. I can just go smart insert here and it'll insert it at this transition point, at this edit point here. That's nothing new yet. This was yeah, still is. there in 2016. Okay, so now we've got a nice little oh, edit. Right now, 2019 now so. what's really exciting about the new cut pages is there's better transitions and a whole new palette design. So if we, uh, first off, because we're going to be adding some transition, let's enlarge the, uh, the view a little bit. You can see we can enlarge that now here, and then we can get a better view on what we're doing. So if we go to the uh, transitions palette, we can see a whole bunch of new transitions. And you can roll over the transitions to try them out. So let's have a look. So we've got the normal sort of, you know, dissolves and I can roll over some wipes, got some wipes here and I've also got fusion transitions down the bottom here so I can do all kinds of interesting things. Um, Just give me that Lucasfilm wipe. I mean, that one's kind of interesting isn't it? Noise dissolve and burn away. So what we can do is um, we can add the transition just by dropping it onto the edit there it is there. So we've got a nice new palette of, of um, transitions in the new cut page. And so I can play that. And let's play through. All nice. And I can also change the uh, duration any way I want and it'll then change the, uh, the way the edit plays. Now we also have new effects in a new effects palette. So I can go up to the effects and you can see all the effects. There's a lot of effects in here. So you can see I've got a whole range of different uh, effects. I've got all kinds of like blurs. There's a zoom blur, which is kind of cool. Drone over like CCTV. All kinds of interesting features. I've got stylized effects, color effects. Hype over those generators. fusion effects because that's like pretty good presets, probably. Yeah, I, I like effects. their I like their filters. 
I've been using them a little bit more lately. Dramatic. I hope you showed us the, the top ones. And boss. So that was the good stuff. Vignette. We've also got some other ones like stylized effects, um, texture effects. One's a really fun one is analog damage, and I'm really shocked at how well it does. I'll drag to, it down to see a preview. It's mm -hmm. really quite amazing. It's it looks like an old VHS yeah, I, I don't know machine, and it's really quite accurate in what it does. In the you can see if I play that, it really looks like an old VHS machine. Now the other thing we've done down the bottom too is you'll notice that what? when you do add an, um, an effect, you know what the there's a larger effects icon the, down the bottom. They're just taking the effects to, from the so color page yeah. and adding them to the cut page. And they're yeah, taking effects from the from edit page but, and adding know, them to the cut page. The lens flare and the lens distort yeah. actually simulate actual um, lenses. Like the only yeah, new thing for now is the overlays, the, which is you know, just pretty made work, fusion so you get, stuff so that, that they're adding as a free preset. Yeah, a bit of a recycle, but I do appreciate when programs kind of try to re... I'm a little worried because the cut page... So it's almost like they're trying to make a totally fusion. new so video time, editor like. inside their video editor. You know? Yeah, it does kind of feel that way. I don't so see a real time. benefit to it yet, honestly. No, me, me neither. It's, 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 the the and there's the already other see. editors that are targeted um, at, like, okay, you want to make a quick yeah. and simple edit. There are also editors that, like, AI cuts your footage and it actually works well. You know, like, what, who is this for? The cut well, we page. also have some new timeline features. You've noticed that we've got a... I could be wrong, but does this look like they're kind of leaning into the style of Final Cut Pro? Because Final Cut Pro is known for its speed, the isn't other it? The big thing we've got is uh, when you insert a clip now... Mm. I mean, I've seen some Final Cut Pro stuff. So, for example, if I put a... If you don't have the magnetic timeline uh, stuff, it, it's not... And I'll uh, the, uh, it's not Final Cut. Here's a nice clip. An in point. Five second duration, but I'll also put a dissolve on both these points here. When I drag that clip into this point, it'll keep the transition on both ends. Now, when I move a, um, a, uh, a clip, it'll also keep the transition. So if I grab this clip and move it down to here, it'll move the transitions with it. We've also made some improvements to the timeline spacing. So when you go down to a uh, large viewer, it doesn't have as much free space here. One of the other things we've done is if you're using a moving CTI. I kind of like uh, that. Like where the CTI moves, like the edit page, we've added like the proper scroll bar in. So you can scroll around. And this now works exactly the same as the, uh, as the edit page does. And if you want to work like that, then Unless that's, that's exactly an old the thing. edit page works. <laughs> Although I really quite like the um, fixed CTI. It works really well with the in hardware panel. The just CTI. On the cut We've also got another new feature in the uh, Yeah, because he, he appended a couple, audio or inserted a couple this clips in the click transition that was there, applied itself at both ends. It'll turn the clips into audio oh. um, waveforms the so it helps you do your trimming against the, the audio and when you release it goes away. The other thing we support is alpha channel keying in the timeline now so you can drop clips in with alpha channels and there's also a new chroma keyer um, so you can do chroma keying in the timeline and there's actually more information in the edit video which I'll play next. Now we also have a redesigned inspector so if I go and click there's an inspector button up here now and you can see that the information is now all ordered by topic so oh it helps God, you organize dude. yourself you can see what's, what's what including metadata changes Video what changes is going on and more. Here? Why is this? And the so inspector is common between the cut, edit, and media, media page, <laughs> so you get some commonality. And also the inspector live updates. So let's have a look at that. So if you go to the audio and you do some. Well, he said some it's common here. with the edit now page. Now when you scroll so along, we're going to get a new inspector. You see it live tracks in the edit page. Now the inspector like... works on both the timeline and clips in your bin now. Nice. And you can also edit time code and dates. Uh, so if your times and time codes and dates aren't right, you can also change those. So let's check that out. So if I've got a shot here, Hype, let's I, change the file, time code. I can change the date, make that the 10th. You can also open transitions in Fusion, and there's more information on that in the Fusion video coming up. Now there's also some, been some big updates to the bin. Um, it now correctly flattens the bin in the source tape, and that's really important because the source tape eliminates media management. You don't need to do uh, media management with the source tape because you can visually browse. So let's have a look at that now. So I'll close the inspector. I'll click the source tape button here. When the camera is on him, look at the like the audio devices behind him. All my media is flattened uh, out. The audio is clipping, even on though them, the media is inside a folder. But if you have a lot of clips, it's really hard to manage. <laughs> um, I've got one friend who's got over two hundred hours of clips. You know, the client just keeps bringing oh, in more, wow, and more media every day. <laughs> um, so the new bins are much more powerful than DaVinci Resolve Seventeen. 
Now we have this new feature called bin dividers. Um, so to see this, let's load in more media so we can kind of create a, a large group of media. Now this media I'm gonna load in from a different job but it helps show how this all works. I've got some media from a cooking show video so let's load that in. Now I've got all my media in the one bin. So now what you can do is you can see the bin dividers are actually showing us dates. Now we can see these bin dividers even if we go into icon view or clip view. There. Or even in list view. See there they are there. So as I'm scrolling through the source I'm gonna tape, show you something later, I can see Avid that they does it best. You can see what's going on. Um, because you can actually take I've each got a individual lot of clip. Here. Now we've also added new sort modes. Wherever you want. So there's other sort modes that we can use and the bin dividers will change uh, based the bin, on the sort mode. Like the bin is like so a big whiteboard where you can, you can put a lot the more clips wherever in. you want that you can make little So we can actually now sort by like clip that. name. That's pretty nice. And, and you'll so see you can like organize like A cam, B cam, and then below you can put multi cam and you can make this little sorted. Or I can even sort by clip color. shape things. But of course there's no color assigned on any of these clips, so they're all the same. Everything's like visually And I can also sort by scene and shot. Now you can see scene one. Oops. Now the bin has an unsorted section for any clips that don't have metadata. But we can use the new inspector to organize these clips. So let's check that out. Now let's go into this clip here and we'll open the inspector up. Go to file and we can see we can actually, you've got no scene information in here. In fact, if we go and click on that one, you can see it says scene one. I'll click on this one, it says there's no scene information. Now we can update these clips really quickly. I can select on auto select the next clip so it makes it even faster. I can then, then type in scene two and enter. And now it's gone and automatically what it's done is it's gone and taken that clip, added scene two to it, it's sorted it in the bin to scene two's location and it's automatically selected the next clip that doesn't have any metadata on it. So I can just go through here and update each one of these. Let's make some of them scene three as well so it'll give us some variation. And now you can see that the bin has sorted them all and they've all been assigned their spots. Now normally you just copy what's on the slates into this uh, metadata here so that the clips would actually match the slates that have been done. Or obviously the metadata could come out of the camera and the clips, like these clips for example already say scene one because they come out of a Blackmagic Pocket Camera 4K and that has metadata support. But what it means is that the bins are always sorted correctly even if you're going to the timeline and doing work on the timeline. I'll close my inspector. Or you go back, whenever you go back to the source tape, your bins are all resorted. You don't have to keep It'd doing be amazing it. Amazing if those can just auto read now, the slates out of the footage. We can actually enter it focus for you. the source tape by the metadata. Actually, that would so be So this sick. is really exciting. Somebody should jump um, what that. it means is that we can zoom into a region by pressing no the source tape couldn't. button, and yeah. it'll then focus on that region. So, for example, if we're scrolling along, and we're now in scene two, if I push the source tape button again, it'll now only show me source uh, scene two. So it means I can go into scene two and then work just on scene two. If I push escape, it'll come back out. And if I scroll along, I'm in scene one, uh, three, push the source tape button, now it's in scene three. Push escape, it'll go back. Uh, normally the source tape, if you put an in and out point, it'll pushing source will focus on the area between the in and out points. But if you don't have an in and out point fo um, set, it'll now focus on the region. So now I'm in scene one, I can go and click the source tape button again. And now it's showing me just the uh, Winter Wonderland media from London and it's not showing me that new cooking show stuff that I bought in because it's zoomed into scene one and all these clips are all being tagged as scene one. Now you can do that with any type of metadata. But all this lets me move between scenes really quickly and then focus in and zoom into the scene that I'm working on and zoom back out when I want to see everything. Now all this works much faster than the speed editor. So let's just pop across here for a sec and have a look um, and you can see how this all works because we've got these big buttons for the source tape and the timeline on here so it's really quick. Now you notice it's actually running. If I scroll up and down the uh, source tape, here you can see like there's nothing plugged in. So obviously it's Bluetooth and that's how it's working. It's got a couple of big batteries in it too. So let's have a look and see how this works on the speed editor. So I can just scroll up and if I push source, I go in and I push escape and I come back out again. I can scroll down here and push source and now I go into scene two. And if I push the scope to come back out, and if I want to scroll down to the scene through uh, one media, I just push the source and there I am. I don't know how I feel about this. So you can see really how fast that is. The speed editor makes it so much quicker 
to do this. It's much more, na and this is a much yeah, more natural way to navigate media. I, I you know, it's know. really based on what the shot is, is it, and not where it's kind of located are, on your disc. Or to take the and time editing to go point over of view, to operate this. I mean, all the editing software I mean, is always focused like much time on I could have spent really where your shots are on the disc. And the keyboard. that's not really the way you edit. You, what you want to know is what the shots actually are. So but I, I think know this some is a whole new way to visually navigate media. And with this focusing, it's really much more exciting and it's much, much more powerful. So let's go back and we'll see what we can also do because we can still navigate by file path. Let's have a look back here. <laughs> now, you might be getting folders of shots from clients, you know, and, you and like my friend was, wheel, right. um, and you want to really look at the and folder. You might be scrolling along and see something in the folder and go, hey, what's else, what else is in there? So we can show you that the file path uh, feature in the new cut page is also much more powerful. So you can see the file path up here now, and that's showing the folder where the media is. And as I scroll around, you can see the path will change. So what that also means is I can navigate down the path as well as up the path. So if I click on that, now the source tape is showing me just the content in that folder. Now if I click back, I get everything. I can scroll along to these shots here and I can then click on the cooking show. I can see just the cooking show clips. And every time I do it, the source tape rebuilds. So it allows me to navigate no by idea. file path if I really want to. Where the source tape is. And it rebuilds every time. <laughs> Another problem we have is icon view is not very detailed. There's not well, a lot of information with it. Yeah, and the list view oh, has no image. Oh, I was just going to say, the way that I've been looking three, through wedding like on, footage you know, and all the sort of stuff views. I've been shooting, I, I kind of would appreciate this for a quick glance, this but any, you know, uh, visual or yeah, I don't know how much I would actually use it. Doesn't have a lot of information. Yeah. So we but then again, you just select uh, everything, drop it into a timeline, and then it's pretty much the same thing. Yeah, because I go through full sequences just in and outing first, and then I'll drop them all, and then trim further. So which is you see the unnecessary information <laughs> and the title will change based on the type of sort you do. I'll show you how I, so I do it later. If I sort I by time code, you'll see the title change. Range. Let's sort by time code. And you can see now it's a date and time code. If I sort by scene and shot, it goes back to showing me the scene and the shot. And the title changes every time. All this makes editing scripted work a lot easier. And the bin dividers remove all the manual working, work of working out where you are. You can move from scene to scene. It's just seamless. You can zoom in, you know, zoom back out again. You can select shots visually. It's all automatic and instant. As soon as you select the source tape, all this happens for you. It's all assembled for you automatically. Um, so it's very exciting. Now, there's also a lot of other cut page features, so I'll show you some of those now. Now, DaVinci is much, much better at relinking clips. So if you've moved a folder, you can relink clips really quickly. Let's go back to the... Uh, Clips and we'll have a look. What we'll do is we'll move one of our folders. We'll create a new folder here and we'll move our Winter Wonderland media into there. Now the interface will have lost track of all that media. So it's all gone offline. So if you move media and you want to relink, you can do that really easily. And the relink icon's up here. It'll now show a relink. Uh, it'll enable. I can select a location. Back to the desktop, there's my untitled folder. There it is. And when I select it, it relinks all the media for me. There it is. So it's super fast now to relink media. No joke. There's it now a whole new media manager as well, to the page which lets you export projects out rather than trying and to pass do it other people. Page. So let's check that out. So we go into the <laughs> media <of> the <laughs> management. <laughs> I, I get a new media manager window. A couple of clicks. I can export out a timeline, and I'll export out the edit I just did. I'll also create some low resolution proxies. Just realize I haven't been let's on RTX Voice this whole time. You heard that car beat because I failed. What I'll also do is I'll put some handles. Oh, no. Can you hear me still? My media. Yeah, I can hear. Okay, you shouldn't hear anything. There was a garbage truck And now what it's doing is window. it's rendering out all my content. Now, this is in addition to the regular archive feature. The archive feature, you, know, you can take all your media and give it to someone. The problem is often that's too big to send. So what this allows you to do is send just the media for the single timeline, but only enough media to support it. And you can also, as I just did, export with handles. And you can export the raw media Before or the transcode. I just did a transcode. Now, this means you can send the timeline and the media to another user, and they can then work that timeline and then return it back to you, and it'll relink back to the original media. So say, for example, if you wanted to send a timeline to a colorist so they could do a better color correction, they could send you back a, a new type of file called a DRT file, which is a DaVinci Resolve timeline file. When you load that back in here, it'll create, recreate the edit. So let's see how that works. What I do is I'll create a new project. And I'll load in my media that I just created on the desktop. 
it is there. And there's the shots I need. And I'll also load in my DRT file. Now the DRT file is a timeline file, so it's very small. There it is there, there's my timeline. So this is what it would be like if I was a colorist and I've just imported the media you've given to me and, and, my, and the timeline. So if I go to the color page and I select some of this, wow, look how small the uh, color wheels are in this view. So I'll uh, just create a horrible looking grade. There it is there. So if I go back to the cut page. Now what I can do is I can export out the, uh, the file. I can export the timeline, desktop. Now if I go back to my other project, I can now see what the colorist well, has given me by importing that this. timeline file. The exportable timeline? There's my new color Yeah, correction. because it's not a new feature, like you could always export a timeline. Uh, uh, that's huh. got my terrible just, color like, grades in it. Talking us there through. It is there. And that's relinked really back to the original media. Um, so the great thing about this is only the stuff. timeline file needs to be sent back. And the DRT hmm. timeline files are really small, so they can be emailed. Now the remote you know, user can also send you constant updates, so if you've got someone who's doing a large job and they're doing constant work, they could keep sending you DRT files back and you can just keep loading them in. It'll link back to your original media and you can see the work they're doing as they're progressing. There's also been some improvements in the viewer. We've got a full screen button now, so you can go full screen and play. I probably should get rid of this uh, change back to my original edit because my color grade wasn't good. We've also got safe area and safe title markers now, which you can turn on and there's a menu for those. So you can set all kinds of no more control aspect ratios. That. There's also a better quick export menu uh, window as well now. You can see we've got uh, more items in there and it fits better. So you can see there's some really nice updates to the cut page. But now let's have a look at the speed editor. So the big question I guess is why do we develop the speed editor? Well, we didn't want to waste space on a QWERTY keyboard, which we really feel like is probably designed sort of as a modification of a normal keyboard for traditional editing. But we wanted to design a keyboard specifically for the cut page. We wanted something that worked better with laptops. We also wanted something that worked with your regular QWERTY keyboard if you really like that keyboard. You can keep using it because this works yeah, in conjunction with a laptop, it. That's why it was Bluetooth. Not, and that, that so obviously, as nice. I mentioned before, it's Bluetooth and it's got an internal battery. Now the USB, if you look point. at the back there, the USB can be used to charge it. Or you, you can use it with the USB if, uh, if you don't want to use the Bluetooth. Mm. Um, but the Editing on Bluetooth iPads. There's no cable, so it can sit in front of you. Can I'd be alright with that. I use my iPad for now, so, camera, so much. So yeah. the and then we would the like, be happy to use those maybe. Now all the transport even then, controls are on the right hand side here. So LumaFusion on an iPad is pretty decent. Solid metal so style with roller bearings. You got your shuttle, jog, and scroll it's not buttons a there. Product ad, pretty much. Um, now there's timeline <laughs> and uh, source tape selectors. You know when you push the timeline, you're on the timeline. Push the source tape, you're back on the source tape, as we did before. Now you really use all this with your right hand. Your left hand side is for your editing functions, and that's what you use with your left hand. So what it means is you're sort of editing with both hands. You know you're kind of looking for shots here, and you're working with your left hand. Now there's really large in and out buttons. Um, and so the top, sorry, before I mention that, I forgot about the editing functions. The editing functions are up here, and this is where you do your smart insert, append, ripple, overwrite, close up, place on top, and source overwrite buttons. And you've got your big uh, in and out buttons here. You can, you can uh, find them by feel. There's a slight <coughs> gap in here, so you can find them. And then there's a whole bunch of trimming modes, and that's an incredibly powerful feature of this. And then there's transition types. You can select between types of transitions. Now in the top middle is the general functions. There's a whole bunch of random, well not random, but different functions here. And the lower middle is the camera control, is the camera controls for the sync bin, which I'll get to. And then of course you've got the play and stop bar, which is very uh, traditional for, for keyboard. So let's see what it can do and really show how fast it can be. Now I've got a, a monitor just below the camera here, so it lets me actually use the, um, the uh, speed editor here while I'm talking to you. And we'll use the overhead camera so you can sort of see what buttons I'm pushing. Um, and it'll be a bit more uncluttered than if I try to use it in front of the computer. So we've set up a separate monitor here. Now what I'll do is I'll create a new project um, and I'll import the Winner One Land uh, clips into that so we can do some edits and we'll show you how it works. I think so I'll just pop back here for, some, for a moment uh, to do that. Oh, sorry. Better? Yeah, yeah. And I'll load in some shots. Oops, I can do that here. You think it's going to go super fast? 
Super Saiyan fast. Oops, I've got my <laughs> Winter Wonderland shots in there now. I'll also create a new timeline. So we've done that now, and let's create some edits with a speed editor keyboard. Now what we'll do is we'll select the source tape, so we can see what shots we want to get, and we'll scroll along to see what we want to get. Now, what we want to do is we want to select these shots and put them in the timeline. So we'll scroll around looking for nice shots, and I'm just using the search tile, I'm using the scroll function. If I want to get really accurate, I can use jog. So let's get some of this shot there. That shot there looks good. I'll place an in point. I'll place an out point. This is a very fast way to, uh, to find shots. And all I need to do is go and add in with the append button. So I've got one shot in my timeline, and now we'll go and do it to another. So let's have a look around. Now I don't need to do anything, I can just keep looking for shots. There's an interesting looking shot. I'll append that. So I've got two shots in the timeline. So you just go along here looking for different shots. Now we can resize the viewer. There's a resize viewer button on here. And so if I push and hold this button, Oh, shit. I can resize the viewer. <laughs> but it's not working. So I can do that with the search dial. Now, because we're looking for source media, we'll actually make the viewer nice and big. We still understand. Now, using in and out points is quite slow. Yep. So we can do it without doing in and out points. Now, you'll notice on the front of the smart insert and the pen oh, buttons, there's a word clip. Away. Now, these are the bunch of buttons on this keyboard <clears throat> have secondary yeah, functions. And in this case, by selecting those, I can insert the whole clip um, without needing to put in and out points. So let's clear the in and out points. And then we'll go along and we'll just put some uh, clips in. So let's append a whole clip. Let's have a look for something. Um, let's find some of the fill. Oh, that looks pretty good. So let's put that in. That's the whole clip. And we'll look for another store. Oh, that looks pretty good. Append that. Just did an auto save. Let's see what else we've got. Scroll along, looking for something. Oh, that looks pretty good. I'll append that. I don't know why I got so many shots of food. That's probably a bad sign. So we've got a bunch of clips in the timeline. I just added those in just by pushing append. So you can see this is why it's so important we start on the source tape, because you can just roll along looking for clips and drop them into the timeline. Well now let's do some trimming. So we'll go back to the, to the timeline. We can scroll along here and see some of these clips. Now we want to trim off a little bit of some of these clips so we can trim out. There's the trim out button here. So if you hold the trim out button, you can then trim and it live trims. I can also trim in. I can go down. Now you'll see that little smart indicator. See that little arrow there uh, just above the edit point. That edit point shows you where it's going to trim. So you don't even have to do any in and out points or anything. You just have to hold trim. If I hold trim out, I can just scroll that back. And if I go trim in, it'll do the next clip. I can scroll along here and do trim out, trim in. I can even uh, trim out at the end. So you don't have to select. It's very, very quick. You don't have to select any of the... Uh, You don't need to select any in and out points or anything like that. So the great thing about that is that you can just, like I think one, trimming is probably one of the most powerful functions of this of the keyboard and makes it so fast. So now we've done some trimming, let's go and add some dissolves. Now the, you can select transitions down the bottom here just by turning on and off. So normally you've got to drag and drop transitions or you can do a keyboard oh, shortcut. I got we a have a button meeting. that allows you to turn on and off dissolves. <laughs> so let's do that. So go to the front of the timeline. Right now? I can pretty much push a dissolve, so, yep. scroll uh, along. Yep. The, uh, typically, they tend to go on for 40 and add minutes. Transitions. Now everything's got a nice dissolve. Um, do you know how long the stream is? I'm play, probably going to miss my it nice now. Transition. I have no idea. But I, I, I think do they showed up the best training. bits on the beginning. <clears throat> yeah. It's, I can remove the dissolve just as um, so let's have a look at that. A lot of this stuff for me is pretty cool because, again, for me, it's going to be a little bit more of a jump. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm more excited for the auto roto. <laughs> The auto roto and the tracking now, is what I, I can really, really want. The alteration of a dissolve, or I can change the yeah, that's, that's pretty the nice. Back in. I can go along here and I can go. And hopefully, like. Right, well, mm. Yeah, I, I don't. Length, yeah, I that, that's past, really fun to play around with. Some people like actually use the cut yeah, page to uh, cut things out and um, even composite. Like duration. they, so you, you can do a lot of stuff in the cut page without going to the fusion page. It's really interesting. Yeah, I can. Yeah, I gotta play around with the cut page. I gotta understand it, like because I, I'm not, I can't be too critical. I, I don't get it, it more than anything. <laughs> oh, sorry, I was stuck in color page. Uh, oh. So you, yeah, you can composite in the color page. Uh, sorry, I misspoke. Uh, oh, weird. Yeah. So uh, you can do a lot of stuff in the color page, uh, uh, avoiding the fusion page. Um, you know, That's interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, that'd, that'd be really interesting to look into because yeah, the fusion page. Uh, 
I'm more comfortable with the color nodes. <laughs> All right. Okay. Hey, I'm sorry, man. I gotta. Yeah, I gotta go jump no, into this good. meeting. Dude, Calvin, so Probably won't. Thanks so much for but, for coming. Yeah. If this is still going, I'll see if I can jump back in the call. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right. Talk to you. See ya. I push escape to go out of that. Now, if I'm working and I want to trim and edit, what I can do is I might want to review that last edit. So if I double push the full screen button, it'll now take me a couple of seconds before the uh, edit point and then play through it. So it's a really fast way of uh, reviewing an edit in full screen. And if I double press it again, it goes right back to the same part, spot. There's also a button to adjust the audio level of a clip. I've got the audio level button just here. So if I hold that, I can adjust the audio up and down. You can see it there in the, as I adjust the search dial. You see the audio level going up and down on the clip. I can also add markers anywhere I want. If I double press the word marker is in front of the audio level button. So if I double press it, now I get a marker. So I can add markers if I need to fix something later or I want to come back to it. And in fact, if I want to change the color of the marker, it'll put down the marker that's on the right-hand side of the user, on the left-hand side of the user interface just on the left of the timeline, lower timeline ruler. If I want to change the marker color, I double press and hold. And it'll bring up a nice marker color window. So I can select a new marker color. I can scroll along. And now all the markers will be that color. There's also a snapping function, but snapping works a little bit different with the speed editor. When you're using snapping in the UI, it tends to be magnetic. It'll snap onto the edit point. With the speed editor, what it'll do is it'll pause as you scroll through the um, the edit point. So if I turn snapping on, there's a lead indicator to highlight it there. There it is there. Now as I scroll along, it'll stop and pause for a moment on markers and it'll also pause on edit points. So it'll pause for a certain number of degrees of rotation of the, of the search dial. That's how that works. Now I can also markers, I insert new clips and keep the transitions with the speed editor as well. So if I go to the source tape and I go along and look for a, a new clip, so I want to get a bit of that. When I go and do a smart insert, it'll include the transition that was at that endpoint when I put the clip in. So that's really nice too. Now there's other edit modes in the uh, keyboard that are much smarter because they're designed to work with the keyboard. Uh, like the place on top, for example, places a clip on top of the current layer in the timeline. Ripple overwrite will uh, replace the clip in the timeline. And if the new clip is a different length, it'll basically just uh, accommodate it. So if it's shorter or longer, it'll it'll basically change the space and swap out a clip. Uh, the close-up function is really smart. It uses some image recognition to do close-ups of people when they're talking. Um, and it also now in DaVinci Resolve 17 copies the color grade. So when you do a close-up of a shot, if it's got a color grade on it, it'll copy the color grade to the close-up clip. But one of the most unique edit modes is actually called source overwrite. It's extremely powerful for cutaways. So what I'll do is I'll do a quick multicam project and you can see really how that works. So I'll go back over here and create a new project. So go over here, go new project. And we'll create a new timeline. And we'll also bring in our multicam media, which is our cooking show stuff. Now I'll come back to the speed editor and I can click source tape. I can find my wide shot. Now what I want to do is lay down a base layer from the wide shot. So I'll scroll along and have a look. Oh, there it is. So I'll go, well, actually I can just push the, the pen button. Sorry guys, I'm really, really here for the software down updates. The timeline. So there it is there. All now what I want to do is I want to create some cutaways. Um, product the ads shot. they're I'll doing here is. Oh, there it is. So oh, no. Mike, actually I can just push the, the pen button and it'll drop that time timeline. So there it is there. Now what I want to do is I want to create some cutaways. Um, now the first thing I'll do is I'll set it to video only because once I've got my bass layer, I've also got my audio track. Now what I want to do is find some uh, video cutaways and drop them in. And this is where it shows you what the source overwrite function um, really does. It's very powerful. So let's go back to my source tape. Let's look along and find, oh, I've got some nice shots there. Of, well, actually let's get the shots here where they're using the, uh, the cutting things. Let's have a look at that. So she's cutting something here. So if I go and create an in, in point on that and an out point, I can show you how the source overwrite function works. 
So now I've got that shot. Now the great thing about Source Override, it'll place the shot in the timeline on the layer above, synchronized to that base layer, because this is a different camera view. So let's go and push Source Override, and there it is there. Now if I go to the timeline and have a look at that, I'll see if that cuts away nicely. So, and that's all synchronized. So you don't need to care about what you're, what you're doing. So this is what I was talking about. It's, I mean, they showed it last year as well. It's just synced. It, it's time code synced, and then you can drop the second camera angle on top. You know, actually, if it's already synced by time code, like, why not just show us a multicam here? I, I, I guess they'll get to that, because that's, that's how you'd actually work this. So you can watch the three angles at the same time, or however many they have. Out point, source override. Let's look for something else. Once she's putting in the ingredients. In. Out. Source override. So I can just pretty much go along and add in cutaways. And there's all my shots, you know, and they're just laid on top. And you see they're perfect cutaways. And that's great, you can just run along looking at all your camera sources, find different cutaways and drop them in and they'll synchronize to the timeline for you. So it's very fast to use, but the problem is what happens if you have multiple cutaways? This is where it gets really exciting and this is what the sync bin is for. So the button up here for the sync bin, if I press that, what it does is it goes off and gets all my synced angles that synchronize to this point in the timeline and shows you all those angles at the same time. So you can see them all there. And I've got uh, six different angles. Hi. So as I scroll along the timeline, I've got a bunch of different views and I can work out what to do. Now this is kind of the reverse of looking at cutaways. Because what, before what we did is we added, you know, we found a shot and added it to the timeline using the source overwrite. The question of course is which cut. You know what, you know, the I might actually use that. You know what, only because you get more screen real estate. Like the cut page gives you a bigger monitor. Uh, than the multicam interface on the edit page. That's a pretty big preview. I don't know if you could have that big of a preview on the edit page. Uh, just because result doesn't allow you to move things around that much. So I can go along and see what else we've got. Um, there's a bit where she's putting something in the box there. So we can go camera one. I can trim the out of that. I can do a source override on that, so that's all pretty good. So that's all there is to it. You just go along and you can find which source is the best source and you can add that in. Now, it, one thing that's worth noting, if you've selected one of the camera numbers, say you come camera number two and you don't want to select that, there's an escape key up on the keyboard here so you can push that. In fact, if you double push escape, it does undo. But if you push escape, you come out of the camera. If you push a camera number, you go into the camera. Push escape, you come back out of the camera. So if you don't like the camera, you've selected it, you know, I don't want that one, just push escape and you come back out of it. Now that's really fast, but there's an even easier way of doing that than this. So let's have a look, and it's called um, live, over, live Override. So if we scroll down, People are going to accidentally undo. Where there's some action. Um, I think there's a bit where she's plating up. Let's have a look where that is. Yeah, that's the bit down there. There's a bunch of stuff happening here. So let's have a look here. Now what we can do is we really like camera number one here. So if I hold camera number one and scroll along, it'll now Live Override that into the timeline. I can scroll along until She's done, moved away from something else, and then she puts the plate down on camera two. So I want to go to camera two. So I can drop camera two down. And that looks good. I can go back to the wide shot, a bit of that. And then I really like camera three. That looks pretty good. You can see putting something in camera three. So you can hold that down. There it is there. So you can see how powerful live override is. It basically just paints the shot into the timeline automatically. And you can see how easy it is to do a bunch of cutaways. But it's really quite easy to bump the jog knob. You know, if you when you release, it'll finish on the out point. But you know, the jog knob's a little bit sensitive, and so you can, I'll turn off snapping. Um, so you can bump it a little bit, and sometimes you can put. Uh, it's the exactly the same demo they did last time for the cut page. Maybe the multicam layout is like new. But other than that, like, where is the update to the cut page? Well, yeah, they already showed some new stuff. Um, I don't know, this segment is just really long. Undo is scrolling backwards. So I scroll along and I kind of like camera four. Now I push camera four. I scroll along. Oh, actually, I like, I'm going to go back and change that because I quite like camera two. 
there's camera two. And there's a bit on camera six, it looks quite interesting, so I can scroll along. Basically, I'm just switching across and scrolling along, adding cli uh, uh, clips. So it's as simple as that, just scroll along and add clips. Oh, now, the transition no, type is no, indicated no. on the bottom here, and I've been doing cut. Look at the numpad, it goes uh, from the bottom, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, like the numpad of a keyboard. Then when he cuts back to the cut page, look at this layout. It should match the numpad, right? So it's actually like intuitive. So it's so it's under uh, as it is under numpad, it should be on the screen. And DaVinci won't let you reshuffle those. You always uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and when I select a uh, shot and I'll go to camera one. Then I'll add those transitions, and they're different again. I don't think they should have modeled it on numpad, especially because you're never going to type on it. Its only purpose is to cut camera angles. Uh, there's no reason to go, you know, to have it numbered like that. I might want to change to a uh, ripple wipe. So you can still do all the trimming that you'd like to do. I can roll the edit. If I don't like the edit points, I can do all that. So I can scroll along, and there's my. I edit. So you can see how fast that is. Now that's what's really funny about this is that if that's not even fast enough, let's go back a little bit and I'll show you something we added as a bit of fun. So I'll go back to this point here. I'll go back into the sync bin and I'll turn the low overwrite function back on. Now we thought it'd be really funny is if a lot of times when you're editing, say a music video or something like that, it doesn't really matter what camera you, you cut to and really quite on the duration that you are either. So we thought it'd be funny to create a random function. So if you push the live override button twice, <laughs> it's well. got the word random on the front. It'll just pick a, a um, camera source and of a roughly random duration and just put it down. And if you keep doing it, what? it'll keep placing transitions. I can push dissolve and it'll do them with dissolves. <laughs> and now, you know, this is not the, really the best media for it. But if I go back to the timeline, now I've got pretty much a random edit. Oops. Go back to the timeline, and I've got this sort of random edit that if that was a music video or something, that can be a lot of fun, and you can... This is like a parody of what an editor actually does. What is, what is going on? Who, who, listen, like black magic, holy, like, imagine this conversation they were having, like, yo, let's add a button that just adds random cuts to your edit. Isn't that gonna be fun? For like music videos and shit? Like isn't that isn't that what what kids do those days? It's random cuts, random duration, random camera. <laughs> do that because oh there's weird tax problems around the world. But if you buy it through a reseller then we'll be able to get the key keyboard and bundle that. So it'll be really exciting. So it means you don't need to buy both. You don't have to buy the Vinci Resolve Studio and the keyboard. You can just buy the key, um, DaVinci Resolve Studio and you get the keyboard for free. Now this is just an introductory offer, it'll be available for the next few months, but we think it should be really exciting. So moving on, we're now the next step is the edit page. Now we've got some really nice updates to the edit page as well. Um, now we do have a longer term plan to share more features between the edit and the cut page, uh, but we've really been focused on the cut page for speed, because uh, the pages have different uses. So we've really been focused on the individual pages for the moment, but you will see in future updates some cross-pollination between the cut and edit pages. However, let's uh, play a clip from one of the trainers to show us what's new in the edit page. There are dozens of new time-saving features and creative tools for editors in DaVinci Resolve 17. When working with multi-camera projects, it's easier than ever to set up and sync angles on the edit page timeline. You can let Resolve do the hard work of aligning multiple clips using either timecode or audio waveforms. That's nice. That's Once really you nice. have your clip synced, it's now simply a matter of creating the multicam clip directly from a timeline or compound clip. That is massive. Before perfect for ensuring the different to angles are set backwards. up and aligned just the way you need. You have to create the multicam and then recreate. DaVinci Resolve 17 um, now supports better handling of interlaced footage for both editing and delivery. New options in the project settings allow you to deinterlace the footage using the DaVinci Resolve Neural Engine for much higher quality results when integrating archive footage in your progressive edits. And there is now full support for interlaced timelines. 
with the option enabled, all footage, including motion graphics and keyframed animations, are processed at the field level for smooth interlaced results. You can even step through the individual fields directly on the timeline. Adjusting a traditional 16x9 timeline for the square or portrait delivery formats common to online and social media used to mean resizing and manually tracking content to the new aspect ratio. In DaVinci Resolve 17, Smart Reframe uses the DaVinci Resolve Neural Engine to automatically identify the main focus of the shot, I think I I adding did that keyframes where necessary year, to keep that subject in frame. It's, it's really cool, and I, I'd love to play with this. DaVinci Resolve 17 gives editors even more tools and enhancements to build commonly required visual effects without requiring you to leave the comfort of the edit page. The new 3D Resolve effect here lets you perform keen tasks using intuitive on-screen effect controls to select, refine, and mask the mat all without the need to go to the fusion or color pages. That's good. That's really good. And you can now use internally and externally generated traveling mats by using the new composite mode options to specify the alpha or luma mats and the foreground layer to combine multiple images together for creative results. Oh, that's great, that's great. Uh, when looking for effects in the effect yes, library, new thumbnails for transitions, titles, Although or filters provide a live preview of that effect, I, making I wonder, it quicker to locate and select the exact effect. How is it going to look when you apply like six of them to one clip? That's what I'm worried about. Because in Premiere, like you have this big drop down and you see all the effects you applied. Uh, but in the inspector, what you just have, you just scroll for like infinity. Um, so that's the thing I'm worried about. And corner pin an image quickly. Changing the composite mode to soft light. Built in tracking. And adding a couple of keyframes. Ah, uh, kind of, kind of, kind of. Really helps sell this final effect. Uh, Try, we need tracking. The brand new video collage effect allows you to build complex but uniform composites. That's sick. It's a cool preset. And then quickly animate them on and off screen using simple built in presets or manual keyframing. That's massive. It's, I, mean, I mean, that's just. They put in a lot of work. Use it to set up simple yet effective split screen and picture in picture effects, or use it to just simply enhance your graphics. The new proxy editing workflow dramatically improves performance for projects which use high quality media, allowing for a smoother editing experience. From the project settings, <laughs> he, choose the he resolution. Showed us dropping frames, like what format, is that example? and location where your proxy files will be created. Then select the clips in the media pool and choose Generate Proxy Media. Actually, alternatively, you can link to any type of externally generated proxy media. Okay, yeah, so there was a big problem with uh, DaVinci proxies because you generate a proxy like using that system, uh, but the proxy would just go like you don't know where, and you can't actually you actually can't find it and send it to somebody else. They would generate their own proxy format, uh, which would only work in DaVinci Resolve. You you could never hand it off to anybody else. But now you can select what type of proxy you want and where you want it to go, which is great. Tone will allow you to create a more compact and portable project archive, allowing you to easily transport entire projects between edit systems, whether on hard drive or via cloud storage. These are just a few of the many enhancements that DaVinci Resolve 17 brings to your editing workflows. That's not that much. So you can see some really nice features in the editing in uh, DaVinci Resolve 17. 
you know, some of the features are common between the two pages, um, but we think both ways of editing are very powerful. And you, know, you can always switch between the pages or use both, so that's really nice. Now we've also had some uh, done some good updates with Fusion as well. Um, there's much better integration with editing. So let's play the Fusion uh, demo video and have a look and we'll see uh, what's new in Fusion. The Fusion page in DaVinci Resolve 17 introduces several new features. These include Fusion Effect Templates, Shape Nodes, an Anim Curves modifier, the ability to convert and modify transitions, audio playback and waveforms, and several user interface updates. Oh, 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 oh that's... Templates are fusion compositions we that didn't can be used as plugins audio on the Edit for Cut page. Remember that, guys. Be grateful. This brings the power of Fusion's tools to you an editor's no fingertips. Audio in fusion. As an added bonus, these templates are stored as text files that are small enough to email to people on your team on a specific or share beat? online with the Forget wider DaVinci it. Resolve Memorize community. Memorize the time code it was on and then do it in Fusion and then bring it back to, edit, to the on Edit page. the Fusion page. page, you can use almost any 2D way. or 3D node to create your desired effect. Once you've created your desired effect, you package this into a template by selecting your fusion nodes and selecting Create Macro. The Macro window allows you to select which parameters to display on the edit page. You can also change the name of parameters, starting default value, um, so this and minimum is just, and maximum. You can create presets uh, for effects easier. So it's easy to use and tweak on the edit or cut page. Back on the edit and cut page, this plugin is now available to apply to any clip and adjust to get the final result you want. I think that means more people are going to be making effects uh, and, you know, putting them online, which is going to be sick. The layered effect. The Fusion page in DaVinci Resolve 17 introduces a new category of nodes called Shape Nodes. These nodes are designed to generate, modify, and hey, render huh? vector shapes. Yo, back. They are perfect for a variety hey, of motion right. design Fusion projects like on. graphics, commercials, okay. or title sequences. Hey, are you able to when creating stream? animated templates uh, for titles, transitions, so or effects, real time. the new Anim Curves modifier uh, allows yeah, that animation to easily scale based on the clip. I'm also wearing duration. headphones, so that things should be better. The templates automatically be nice adjust to, to fit the length time. of the clip or transition, even if you change the duration on the timeline. Let me know if it works. In this node tree, we modify the X parameter of a transform node with anim curves. This will animate the image from left to right. In the inspector, under the anim curves Good modifier, there are a variety of controls. Yep. Scaling Sick. controls the stretching or squishing of the animation, and offset controls the starting point. Now comes the really powerful part. You can adjust the curve setting to change the interpolation from linear to easing or to a custom setting that allows you to draw your own animation curve. For this clip, we choose Sine Curve to create a smooth start and finish. They went through the edit page updates. Uh, Back on the edit page. A lot of stuff you can do in Fusion, you can do in uh, uh, the edit page now, uh, like chroma nice. key and some like basic uh, corner penning of the stuff. Can be That's what they to a fusion cross dissolve. Nice. This I saw, allows you I saw to customize little glimpses of things. However you would like using fusion Is tools. the king real time? Uh, I think so. To modify so. a transition, we add any standard awesome transition awesome if it was GPU accelerated. Then, via the pop-up menu, we convert the transition to a fusion cross dissolve, then open that transition in the fusion page. Media in 1 represents the first clip, and Media in 2 represents the second. We can modify the Fusion Cross Dissolve by opening the group and changing the Dissolve node's operation. For example, a gradient wipe allows the artist to connect an arbitrary gradient to be used as the wipe source. In this example, fast noise and displacement nodes are used to create a distortion effect. By using the Anim Curves modifier, we ramp this distortion effect from 0% to 100% on clip A and 100% to 0% on clip B. This modified transition can be used as is, or similar to Fusion Effect templates, it can be saved as a transition template. It's on the edit or cut pages, now. this transition uh, will appear yeah, in the Fusion Transition really nice. section and can be added and modified of like an any other transition. <laughs> but I don't like their presets. 
Like you can customize them harder. Audio now. playback and visual uh, waveforms are now available on the Fusion page. This makes syncing VFX to a musical beat, sound effects like gunshots, or audio. There used to be no audio in Fusion. Like just let that sink in. Dude. No audio, <laughs> and now they finally <laughs> added it in. Create their own toolbars tailored And I'm just about to start getting into comp task. and audio. So that's good timing Edit for me. And cut page timeline markers are now visible and editable on the Fusion page. That's sick. Node editor bookmarks have been added to help Fusion artists quickly navigate large node trees. Bookmarks can be manually created and are also automatically generated when you use underlays. New advanced optical I feel flow like nobody processing would use that. brings That's significant cool. speed increases for read I mean, times, frame repair, know their scripts and other well. operations that use optical flow. Oh. Lastly, additional GPU accelerated resolve effects tools are now available on the Fusion page. This includes Did utility operations the optical flow? like film grain uh, and no. noise reduction, and also high quality creative effects like lens reflections and analog damage. No matter if you're an experienced fusion artist or an editor trying it out for the first time, there are incredible new features and enhancements available to you on the Fusion page. So that's a really nice update for Fusion. Plus the rendering speeds have been really increased, which is nice. Now Fusion's popular with visual effects artists, but it's also great for titles too. And we're finding a lot of broadcasters are starting to use it for graphics. Yeah, because it's got a true 2D and a 3D workplace, uh, workspace. So it's Really, really powerful. It's much more powerful than simple title Actually, generators. A video that went viral. So Somebody one of the last things I want to talk about is collaboration. Uh, BBC now this has become more important Fusion. since COVID. So what we're doing today, we're announcing we're going to make awesome. the collaboration free of charge for um, Love to see that. both DaVinci Resolve, the free version, and DaVinci Resolve Studio. So you'll just be able to download it. Now we think this will help people work together. Um, collaboration will be the free download. You just go and download it manually. Now at the moment, um, it'll work with both versions. As I said, it'll work with both versions of DaVinci Resolve, but we haven't had time to actually build a, a special installer for it. At the moment, it's still actually bundled with DaVinci Resolve Studio. So what we'll do is before DaVinci Resolve 17 goes final, uh, we'll basically make a separate install and that'll be downloadable from our website directly. So you better keep an eye out for that and then you'll just be able to download it. Uh, but we thought it might be a good idea to show you a video on some of the capabilities of DaVinci Resolve collaboration and really show you how powerful it is. Um, so let's play the video and we'll show you how the multi-user collaboration works with DaVinci Resolve. Using Resolve's oh, collaboration for this. Tools, multiple artists can organize, edit, color, mix audio, and create visual effects at the same time. When working with multiple editors or assistants, timelines work on a first-come, first-served basis. The first person to open a timeline has ownership as indicated by the red this playhead. Was already if your playhead is gray, but someone else is already working be available on that timeline, to free users, and you won't be able to make changes. Which is massive. However, ah. you can still play back and review it so you with don't need all the current the updates. Don't Studio anymore to have this. Once the changes have been made by the owner, a refresh icon appears in the upper right corner of the timeline viewer to let you know that the timeline has been modified. Clicking the icon updates the timeline to the most recent cut. Bins also work on a first come, first serve basis. A bin is locked and is displayed with the team member's color if they have it selected. You can also right-click the bin and select Lock Bins to keep other editors from making any changes even if you select another bin. The keep bins you lock have a lock icon <laughs> next bin. to them, and the other members of your team Nobody will see your collaborator icon color next to that bin. That's my trash. access to a lock bin, the chat functionality is a great way to ask for another editor to release that bin. DaVinci Resolve chat, that's... I... The color that's page works amazing. a little differently in the sense that it is clip locking instead of timeline locking. This means you can have a colorist or multiple colorists working at the same time in the same timeline. When you are on a clip in the timeline, your collaborator icon will appear on the clip on other members' workstations. This lets everyone know who has ownership of that clip. The colorist can set a look on a clip, then send a message to another colorist via the chat function, and ask them to I match have a lot of questions look. about this <laughs> using multiple colorists because you can like you can group clips so I can have I can be grading five clips at the same time and what happens then do five clips get locked like did they think about that I hope they did so you can see the new look <laughs> you can also see these changes occurring in real time on the edit page 
Just as when you are updating your timeline, you will see a refresh icon appear in the upper right corner of the clips that have been updated in the color page. Clicking the refresh icon will update the color on the edit page. Like the color page, the fusion page also uses clip locking. Similar to the color page, a VFX artist can work on the fusion page while other artists work in the same timeline on any of the other pages. When you are on a clip in the timeline, That's the cool. collaborator icon will indicate to the other team members who has ownership of that clip. In this collaborative environment, a lead VFX artist can quickly QC other artists' work or make tweaks immediately. A lead artist can also set up a composite tree and message another artist to take over and finish some final tasks like rotoscoping or have another artist copy those nodes and apply them to similar shots. Once you have locked picture, you are now ready to move on to the final mix. All you need to do is move to the Fairlight page and begin. Like the edit page, the timeline is first come first serve. If you open a timeline, you can tell you have ownership when your timeline playhead is red. On other member stations, your playhead will look gray. You will not have the ability to make changes, but you do have the ability to play back the mix for anyone That's to review. That's actually really, Just as really when cool you are on the for edit teaching page, people You will be to able things. to see any updates that are made on color and fusion in real time. They can With the collaboration features in DaVinci Resolve 17, change. your entire team can work simultaneously on the oh, same yeah. project to edit, grade, composite, and mix faster than ever before. So you can see collaboration has a lot of power. It's integrated so well into DaVinci Resolve and it's used by a lot of high-end facilities. It's powerful enough for big feature films, but we think more people can benefit from it, which is why we want to make it uh, free of charge. So DaVinci Resolve 17, it's a big update. Now That's what amazing. we're going to do is we're going to make a public beta av available today. You'll be able to download it once the website goes up. It'll be a, uh, DaVinci Resolve 7, 17 will be a free update for all DaVinci Resolve customers. We think it's the biggest update in the history of DaVinci. You know, it's got a lot of really polished features and I think this will really upgrade uh, the work you do. It'll be really exciting. So that's about all we have for this update. Um, I want to thank the engineering team. We've worked really hard on this update and really long hours in some difficult conditions, often working from home and, and weird locations. Um, some of the features in DaVinci Resolve 7 have taken a long time to develop too and we think they've done a fantastic job. Also again, thanks to the DaVinci Resolve community. You guys have graded some fantastic feedback and we've had some great conversations even without trade shows. We've still been able to have great com uh, conversations. Now there's a new website for DaVinci Resolve. The marketing team have been working really hard on it. They've done a great job. It includes a lot more information about DaVinci Resolve, especially if you're a new user and you want to learn about some of its key you know, functionality. Um, we also want to thank people who've upgraded to DaVinci Resolve Studio. That owes, those upgrades pay for engineering. Obviously so do sales of keyboards and, well not that keyboard because we're giving it away for free, but you know, sales of keyboards Wait, and audio consoles and color huh? panels what? also help. Uh, uh, pay boy? for engineering. Who gets that a just makes DaVinci Resolve I get a even better. So <laughs> we hope you like the new DaVinci Resolve 17. We hope, of course, you send yours. I'll send you mine. <laughs> um, we hope you really like this update, and we can't wait to see how you use the new features. And that's always the most exciting spot. So thanks Thank very much boy. for watching, and, and take care, and talk soon. Bye. So free, free with what? <laughs> I don't. That's got to be. That's got to be with the purchase of something. I think you made a mistake. What do you mean free keyboard? <laughs> I don't think that keyboard's free. Uh, I think he talked prices about it. What? <laughs> free keyboard. Okay. Huh. So what did, what did I miss from the edit page? I saw little glimpses. I saw the picture in picture with the yellow circles. And I saw a perspective, a corner pin, where he put a logo onto a glass panel. Uh, edit page. So the inspector is new, right? Uh, so we're going to have a bunch of new effects, like, you know, when you have your effects library. So now a lot of stuff that you can do in Fusion, uh, they showed an example of the chroma key here. So he just took the chroma key effect and just dragged it onto a clip. Uh, and then in this inspector, he had all the controls for the chroma key and he just kind of drew on the screen over the green screen and it sampled the green and removed the green. Uh, so that's one thing. Actually, wait. Very curious to the... Really Very curious wild. how good the keying is, because like I've never seen a proper key done in Resolve yet, just because I haven't looked. But it'd be uh, it'd be interesting to see if it can grab me away a little bit from Nuke. I think keying with just, uh, with nodes is still better. 
because you just have so much much more control, right? You, or you can like key multiple times. Absolutely, plans. absolutely. Like for big projects, I'll I will never not say no nuke. <laughs> um, but yeah, in terms of just, I there's a lot of stuff that I want to start doing for track tutorials. Like there's some stuff that I wouldn't mind just quickly drag and dropping stuff into Resolve and just just going with it. <laughs> There's a lot of new effects here. I'm going to zoom in on this. The interlacing, patch replacer, light rays, glow. Uh, patch replacer. Wasn't patch replacer around? I know the other stuff was like glow and light rays, but... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Man, I yeah, wish I, I wish I didn't miss the middle chunk of this. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what the good thing with YouTube is, you can uh, you can rewind it a little bit, or heck, even rewind the, the live stream a little bit. <laughs> What's that Anyone witchcraft? That? <laughs> You're telling me I can look into the past. Look to the past and then see the the most, you know futuristic oh wait look at that do you see the screen right now yep 3d key uh, I, yeah, I see your stream on here oh i sorry i can do the same thing with the share screen uh, yeah I, I can see it on the stream it's not too delayed right, well you have both now uh yeah like keyers nice and it's nice to have a here he just drags it on the clip Luma keys are very handy. Look, look at this. That's sick for the new inspector. 3D keyer. It's called a 3D keyer? Weird, right? What, is that, what does that mean? I've never heard of a 3D keyer. <laughs> <laughs> Alpha mat shrink and glow. HSL that, keyer. Luma keyer. Alpha mat, Alpha mat shrink and glow, glow is a huge deal. Um... When you're keying, have you keyed much? Uh, I keyed a, a, a few things. Um, in well, no. yeah, I, I, I've, I think I'm familiar with the the keying controls. Uh, yeah, you ever notice when you you ever notice when you key something, uh, you'll get fringing on the edges of your character, and let's yeah. say if you got and let's say okay, you've done a despill or you've tried to erode in so that you can get rid of that funny looking edge. But if you erode in, you tend to destroy hair detail. So then it kind of puts you off eroding. So you're left with this weird little color fringe. But what people do is there was a part of the stream where there was an airplane. He cut it out and then he shrunk the sky inwards and got rid of the airplane. Yeah. That, that is big. That is, uh, that is how professional VFX artists, professional comp artists, uh, clean up their keys this is hard to explain so i won't really go into detail but there's a really fancy method of keying a nuke where we we can we can paint out the character and then use the background with the painted out person yeah use that background to help with uh telling our actual keyer what the background looks behind the person so that it can use that modified plate and the original plate together, that makes and then sense. get an even better yeah. key. It's kind of. But like, then what we also. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, I, I mean the closest example I can think of, uh, something similar is like when you're cutting something out in Photoshop and then use the con smart content fill replace feature. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then the like the last part of it is when you. We would also then take an, a third layer of the character and we would take the edges of like their shirt, their hair, their face, like everything, every edit, ed, uh, edge, and we would extend the color of the edge outwards. So it just looks like they're an inflated version of themselves. But now that that color is outwards, it, it gets rid of the fringe uh, underneath that your alpha layer in your key. It, yeah, it's a weird thing to explain. <laughs> but... Uh, yeah, that's that's a big that's a pretty big tool. That's sick. And um, I'll, I'll skip ahead a little bit here. And they have a lot of uh, 
they do a little drop down on the keying controls. I, I don't know if you see it here, but you know, you got all of the the usual, you know, stuff and you would have in a gear like you know the noise and white clip, black clip, yeah. and out ratio, blur radius, clean white, all inside the edit page. Like you might actually have. I mean, you, you're gonna get a good, good-ish key without having to go to Fusion, which is sick. Yeah, is, it, is there any point where they where they just play it? Like, does it just play? Man, if that just plays. That would be amazing. Oh, there you have your a zoom in here. You can even oh, garbage nice. mod. Wow. Nice. Garbage matting within the node is handy. Dude. I wonder how many points they allow, or if it's like a preset eight or four point, or if it's actual like let you draw shape in that within this viewport. They play it. Ooh. I, oh, I, is that real time? They yeah. didn't render it? Doesn't look like there's a render bar. Uh, no, I don't think they caught it, and it's not dropping any frames or anything like that. Nice. That's impressive, yeah. And then there's more blend modes. Um, so you can... Yeah, I, th I remember like looking through this. On text and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember looking through this at one point thinking they were missing stuff. Because <laughs> <laughs> blend modes, I'm, I'm really big into blend modes. Yeah, like you couldn't just take text and then like put a, a video inside that text. You would have to go to Fusion to do that. But now you can do that in, in edit, which is sick. That is awesome. Nah, I mean, man, I'm excited for this. And they said it's available to download now, right? I'm yeah, gonna... right now, the, the public beta. Yeah, and, it lo and since it's a separate install, they said it was, right? Not just an update? Uh... Yeah. For, yeah for my... now, it's gonna be a an update later. Okay, because uh, I'm I'm totally cool with a separate download because the updates for some reason just wouldn't won't work. Oh yeah, because your errors. update doesn't work. Huh. Yeah, no no clue why. I'll I'll have to figure it out. I just haven't sat and thought. Okay, I'm gonna figure this out. <laughs> I hope, like I kind of wanna just update it to it straight away. Uh, but on the other hand, I know <clears throat> it's bad practice. Yeah. It could just, like, everything could just break. I'm just going to go ahead and do it. <laughs> there's, there's, too much, there's too much stuff in there I want now. I want the Roto specifically. Yeah. Dude, if you could have, like, two versions of DaVinci without risking all your, all your like, old projects or current projects you're working on, that might just, like, crash and burn and explode. <laughs> yeah exactly yeah all the other software i have i'm always keeping the old versions when possible yeah but yeah it's yeah i'm i'm excited i don't know that a lot of that stuff for me was a bit more of a jump so i'm 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 looking forward <laughs> dude and the collaboration thing that's right collaboration cool. yeah that that made me quite happy because like i again i uh like i've just been starting to do a little bit of videography stuff uh a friend of mine who does photography has been has been uh hiring me to go and help him out with some stuff uh so we shot a wedding and we were supposed to shoot one today but he uh, we were he has to edit the video side of it anything i shoot he'll, he's editing mm -hmm. it'd be kind of cool if i can just kind of do my own thing for fun and have him collaborate on on the side yeah and that chat looked really it looked really it's funny that there's chat in DaVinci, but I'm That's wondering if that chat I wonder I hope that chat's gonna be like, hey, there's a note specifically on this clip. Go to that clip and then you get that you get the chat. Like don't just give me a chat where somebody has to describe where a clip or something is. I mean like I hope this is, things to the chat kind of. And then people like click it in chat and then it takes them where you need to be. Yeah, I can't remember if that's what it was. <laughs> if it was but, like uh, that, that'd be cool. Yeah, because that would make me all for having chat in DaVinci. Otherwise, what's the point just using Slack or whatever else you got on the side that you're using with a company? Yeah. It's... They're, they're probably just, like, thinking about, like, totally new people uh, that, like... I don't know. You, you probably have, like, a friend that will, like, never download Discord or whatever. You know, they're, like, 
they have their ways and they like it their way and they're not going to try new tech. So by it being built into DaVinci, they're, you know, you don't have to like beg them to be on some <laughs> chat. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see more. I'd like to see more about the chat and the collaborative features. Because yeah, that, that to me is, the more that I think about it, the more that I'm more into it. <laughs> but yeah, everything else is... Everything else is pretty cool. I'm excited to jump into those new filters and especially the picture in picture. Picture in picture is something that I never wanted to do in Resolve. Cuz cuz Fusion I'm just not just not well versed in and Fusion I just don't really feel motivated to when I'm using other compositors. So it's kind of a weird weird gray area for me. Definitely excited to be able to admit, use that in also real time. That that also looked real time. Yeah, that looked really good. Cool. Yeah, they're they're pre-recorded demos. Like it could be, um, anything could happen. I guess. Yeah. Run on a beast PC. They just popped into NASA. Like, hey, can we just record this demo for our <laughs> 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 for editing software update? Just can we use your PC, please? <laughs> <laughs> At least it's not nineteen sixties NASA. Yeah. They sent the shuttles up with the processor of a calculator. I I think I'm gonna well dude, that was great. Great update. I think I'm gonna end the stream. Uh and then we we can uh, like have a have a little chat after uh, for a few minutes and then we'll we'll see. Yeah, for a couple of minutes that'd be cool. Then I gotta get to work. <laughs> yeah. So uh thanks everybody for coming. First for thanks for hanging out. This is this was Matt G edits. I do uh editing live streams. I am actually planning to do some IRL live streams as well maybe like stream when i just go out of my camera and film something or if i'm on set i might try to sneak in a little live stream as i have uh, unlimited data now so that might be coming which is going to be exciting uh do you want to say a few things about yourself uh calvin again at the end sure uh I am a match move lead at Track VFX based in Vancouver, Canada. And we've done stuff like Stranger Things, Rampage. Uh, we've recently done like Terminator, Dark Fate, and a few other projects uh, I'm excited about, but realized I can't talk about. <laughs> so I'm going <laughs> to imagine my face. if you just dropped something <laughs> here. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, wouldn't be the, it wouldn't be the worst. It's just, you know, they don't like announcing what studios are doing what projects, but. You know that's not that's not as bad as straight up saying what happens in a scene. <laughs> let me describe all. Let me just describe out this whole movie. Spoilers. <laughs> um, but yeah, like from Track VFX, we decided we wanted to throw a little tracking knowledge out there, so we started a YouTube channel that primarily I am doing, and we've got a few, I think, a few cool tutorials and streams on there. What's the name of? So I've been channel? starting to sh uh, Track VFX. And I'll be back into streaming soon. I just gotta, just gotta fix up my assets that I lost on a hard drive. <laughs> and yeah, but yeah, hopefully in the future it also will be other people from Track Effects doing some tutorials because I don't know how many people understand it's a studio and not just a some guy talking to a camera. <laughs> true, true. But yeah, but yeah, hopefully I plan to get it a little bit more involved and stuff. And that's that's all I got. Sick. And your Twitch is uh, Calvin at Calvin Kingdom, I think. Yeah. Okay, I, I had it on, on screen for a little bit before, so uh, hopefully people will find your Twitch and stuff like <laughs> that. 